Before I do start this video, make sure to use my TCG player affiliate down below if you're looking for any of these singles that I talk about today. Also, this channel is sponsored by Arcane Fortress. If you're looking for the best deck boxes around, make sure to use my link down below in the description to check them out. One other way you can support the channel is by becoming a patron. There are some great benefits of being a patron to the channel, such as giveaways, deck advice, and more when you do join. Hey, what's going on YouTube? This is Devin coming back at you with another video today on Pub Slump MTG. And in this video today, I'm going to be talking about this very cute and adorable commander called Loot, the key to everything. So this is from the big score. It's like a separate sheet for Outlaws of Thunder Junction with a different symbol. And I want to say this is from like the vault of the Fumori. And I feel like this is going to be a very cool build up for the Fumori and invading everything. Maybe not, we'll see what happens there, I'm only theorizing. But loot itself is a child of the Fumori, and weirdly enough, it's not a giant in addition to its other types, which makes sense, I guess. Maybe it'll just grow into a giant. I'm not a lore expert at all, so I'm not 100% sure what's going on with this specific example. So let's dive into this creature and talk about its stats. So for the cost of green, blue, and red, it's a 1-2 body with Ward 1. And at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of your library, where X is the number of card types among other non-land permanents you control. You may play those cards this turn. So in a weird way, this kind of reminds me of Attracts a Grand Unifier in the aspect where you want to have a lot of permanence in your deck so that you can definitely flesh out more and more card advantage. And so this is a pretty generic and wide open commander that is just a very good value engine for your game plan. So in a weird way, it does remind me also like a Phyrexian Arena because at the beginning of your upkeep, you're exiting only the top cards of your library. So of course with Phyrexian Arena, you're getting that extra card advantage at the beginning of your upkeep. That's the only way I could really explain it but obviously the more permits you do have on the battlefield the more you're going to get card advantage so again this is very generic this is going to be very powerful in a lot of different strategies of course the goal is to have a lot of play from exile effects because you're exiling the top cards of your library and playing them that turn and you want a lot of different permanent types on the battlefield so overall pretty interesting i do feel like this could have a lot of legs especially giving you a lot more card advantage especially the more diversity you do have on the battlefield for stuff that you do own and so let's get right into it let's talk about the commander and talk about the strategy So let's first discuss play from exile effects because our commander is really focusing on that and there's a lot of payoffs that we can take advantage of. First of all, I do want to focus on Sage of the Beyond, mainly because spells you cast from anywhere other than your hand cost two less. This is a great cost reducer and does have flying and is a 5-5 body, plus you can foretell it to cast it cheaper later on. This is a pretty significant ability because if we do have a lot of cards in exile, if we just reduce their costs, it's going to be a lot more mana efficient having those spells reduced from exile than just paying for the complete cost with multiple spells. The next ones I do want to focus on are technically a couple of them with the payoffs of playing from Exile, for example, Keeper of Secrets, Passionate Archaeologist, and Nefeshini. Keeper of Secrets and Passionate Archaeologist are basically the same kind of effect whenever you cast something from Exile or from anywhere other than your hand. They're going to deal damage equal to the spell's mana value to target opponent specifically. Of course, with Passionate Archaeologist, you do have to have your commander on the battlefield, but overall, these are great effects to really apply the damage to your opponents. And of course, with the other one, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name again because I absolutely butchered it, but it does have the great ability whenever you cast a spell from Exile, you copy it, you may choose new targets for the copy. If it's a permanent spell, that copy gains haste and at the beginning of the next end step, sacrifice this permanent. There is a lot of ETB effects with a lot of different creatures or permanents in our deck that we could absolutely take advantage of with this card specifically. So I do feel like this is going to be another slam dunk in the deck. The only thing I worry about is the high mana cost of a lot of these type of effects, but there is a decent ramp package in the deck as well. Next up, I do want to focus on a pretty brutal brutal card that definitely is going to go for that more aggro shell and that's Lelia the Blade Reforged. So let's just say we have five different permanent types on the battlefield and we have our commander out with Lelia. At the beginning of our upkeep we'll exile five cards and then Lelia will trigger putting five 1-1 counters on it. So this will absolutely grow exponentially the longer it is in the game and will be a big giant threat later on. I also do think Delayed Blast Fireball is going to be incredible in this deck because it'll deal two damage to each opponent each creature they control. If it was cast from exile you could deal five 
five damage to each opponent and each creature they control instead. All just for three mana if we cast it from exile. Of course, it does have the foretell ability to cast it for more mana, but really we're going to be evading that completely and going to be casting this for three mana most of the time. Following that, I do want to talk about Flaming Tyrannosaurus. This is going to be excellent on the deck because whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, so we're going to be casting things from exile, so this is going to be easy to trigger multiple times. You can deal three damage to any target, so like a lightning bolt to anything you want. Then put a 1-1 counter on Flaming Tyrannosaurus, and if you think that's it, you're absolutely wrong because when it does die, it deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. This will ultimately give your opponents the tough choice of removing it or not to remove it because if they don't remove it, it's just going to grow exponentially and deal a lot of damage with that lightning bolt effect. But if they do remove it, it's going to blast people for a lot of damage. So it is really making that tough choice for your opponents, but we're going to be getting all the value from it. You all know I love my dinosaurs. I couldn't resist adding a couple more like a Tali Primal Storm and a Tali Primal Conqueror. These both have that fantastic ability to basically steal cards from the top of your opponent's library, as well as playing cards from your library too for free. Itali Primal Conqueror is probably one of my favorite commanders ever, and it's a shoe in in this deck for sure because it can flip into a big giant scary threat that could potentially end the game. But really, I like playing it for that first ability for the ETB. You're going to get that immediately. And with the OG Itali, if it does not eat removal, you're going to get exponential value the more attack triggers he does have. Next up, I do want to focus on permanent types. Of course, there's not going to be a lot of instant and sorcery spells in this deck specifically, but we can take advantage of a lot of different value engines. For example, Paradox Haze, as well as Sphinx of the Second Sun, will get those upkeep triggers again and again. So these are specifically great because, of course, we want to get the most value out of our commander, of course, with the more permanents we do have on the battlefield. We can't see more cards in Exile that we could play that turn. I do also like Chimel, the Inner Sun, mainly because for six mana, spells you control can't be countered, so say goodbye to blue players trying to remove your spells by countering them. And at the beginning of your end step, you discover five. So the big reason why I do like this card specifically is the fact that you could discover five at the beginning of your end step. You could constantly just put more and more permanent types on the battlefield and then trigger your commander more and more. And it's at the beginning of your end step. It's not at the beginning of your upkeep. So you could cast this spell and then immediately get value later on. Next up, I do want to focus on battles because battles are a specific permanent type that you do own. And I mainly wanted to point out ones that'll give us value over time that basically replace our instant and sorcery spells. Of course, they can't replace all of them, but they can do some value engine-y stuff. For example, Invasion of Kaladesh will make us a 1-1 colorless laughter artifact creature token with flying. So with this entering the battlefield, technically we are getting three different permanent types with battle, creature, and artifact with that thopter. And then with Invasion of Call Time, it does have that ability to exile cards from your hand, then draw that many cards until your next turn. You may play those exiled cards, so it's kind of diving into that play from exile theme a little bit more. Invasion of Ikoria is a great tutor for a creature. Invasion of Zendikar is a great way to ramp ahead. And Invasion of Shandalar is more important because of course you can return permanence from your graveyard to your hand. So I didn't put all the battles in but I did put a decent amount to trigger our commander a little bit more. I do also want to focus on enchantment creatures like Colossal Sky Turtle, Dryad of the Elysian Grove, and Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Colossal Sky Turtle is a little bit more versatile in the fact where you could channel it to basically return a card from your graveyard to the hand, or you could return a creature card to its owner's hand with those channel abilities. Dryad of the Elysian Grove is going to be excellent with its utility of playing additional lands on your turns because if we do exile a lot of lands, we could just play more additional ones to not lose them all to the exile ability. And with Fable of the Mirror Breaker, what more can be said about this card? It will make three different permanent types if we do swing in with that creature token, making a treasure token, so artifact, enchantment, that's a saga, and also that goblin, that's a creature, so three different card types alone. There are also some great artifact creatures that I do want to highlight that have great utility like Haywire Mike getting rid of those pesky non-creature artifacts or enchantments. Roaming Throne obviously to double up our uh, commander's ability or other abilities that we do have on the battlefield. And with Phyrexian Metamorph basically becoming a copy of anything on the battlefield that's an artifact or a creature. Probably one of my more favorite artifact creatures that have come out in the most recent year is Rose Cutthroat Raider mainly because it has a great raid ability at the end of combat on your turn. If you attack this turn you create a junk token for each opponent you attack. So basically a junk token is you exile the top card of your library and you can play it that turn and whenever you do sacrifice a junk you add a red mana so this acts like a mini jessica's will in a way where you're adding mana and you could also exile the top three cards of your library if you do sacrifice all of them if you do have like three chunk token that you made on that turn and of course the more junk tokens you do have on the battlefield the more you do store them the more you could just get a lot of mana and then dive deeper into your deck playing cards from exile there is also another way that you could build around this deck because the commander is pretty wide open i wanted to focus on landfall but not landfall in the way you think of having 
landfall triggers with creatures here and there. I'm specifically talking about Valica the Molten Pinnacle. So a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I used to play Modern and I used to play Amulet Titan and Honestly, I had a blast with it, but I got over modern and focused on commander more. But sometimes I do miss having that feeling of basically blasting everybody with a Valakut. So that's why I do actually have a second deck list on this video, specifically focusing on a Valakut deck. I do also have some good stuff lands in the deck too, specifically. So this is going to be an original landfall deck, if you could ever call it an original landfall deck. And the reason why I do feel like loot is the perfect commander for this option is because, of course, if we do have more permanent types on the battlefield, we could dig deeper into our deck to find Valakut the Molten Pinnacle. This also does lead me to think about other options that get us extra lands. My favorite option in this deck is Song of Creation. This is going to go wild because of course the more spells we cast the more card draw we are going to get and eventually we will have to discard our hand but that's not a big downside especially if we get an overwhelming amount of value. And of course most importantly this does have the exploration effect. There's so many exploration effects in this deck specifically but again this is a very janky idea and something that I just thought about and something I may build my myself because I absolutely love the idea. So this is just a little taste and you can check out the list down below in the description to see if you want to go this route. And if you and other people like this idea a lot and want to see it on another video for a deck tech, let me know down below as well because I am more than happy to make another deck tech around this cute adorable creature. However that's going to do it for me guys. Thank you guys so much for coming by and watching this video on loot the key to everything. Again this is a very adorable creature and there is actually a lot of buzz around this specific creature. Not a lot of people like this but then a lot of people do. I'm on the camp that I do like this art. A lot of people will call it like a League of Legends art, but again, I'm all for it because it looks adorable, at least to me. But let me know down below in the comments, how would you build around loot? Of course, if there's enough attention, I'll probably make a separate deck tech video for loot specifically in that landfall strategy. So again, let me know down below in the comments, what are your thoughts and opinions? Also, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And with that out of the way, thank you for stomping by.